Okay, so our first question uh, is about high speed rail. Um, unfortunately, because of connection issues, I have to read these off my phone, so I'll be glancing down. Um, the US High Speed Rail Association has released a five point plan for high speed rail in the United States. This includes $172.5 billion uh, for five HSR projects of national significance and then $188 billion in funding for de developing uh, what it calls second tier high speed rail projects. Relating to this proposal, do you believe that the reconciliation bill should also include the $360.5 billion in funding I it identified for high speed rail? Additionally, if it cannot be included, do you believe that a second reconciliation could be passed next year between the midterm elections, excuse me, and the adjournment of Congress? Look, I think uh, all of this is up in the air. I think that to answer the second question first, the second reconciliation bill is probably uh, rather unlikely uh, given what I've heard, but any of this, you know, any of this can, um, can change. Uh, there's a Senate parliamentarian who's technically responsible for what's allowed in reconciliation and what's not. And even people in the Congress don't always know exactly how that Senate parliamentarian is going to rule. We should be making a massive investment in high-speed rail. If we were really smart about how we're spending all our money, one of the best return on our investment for future generations, uh, we would be spending hundreds of billions of dollars on high-speed rail. Politically, realistically, that's just not gonna happen right now. I think we need to prove why high speed rail is so effective by getting a couple of projects up and running. And as I alluded to in my opening remarks, I would strongly encourage us to focus some projects on places that are not used to having rail. Because if you just build high speed rail in the Northeast quarter, look, it's a great place for high speed rail. Um, people are already riding trains. There's already a lot of regional rail. You'll get tremendous returns on that economic investment. Amtrak has, many, has made this case many times before, but the rest of the country will still say, oh, this is just a blue state Northeast kind of thing. Trains can't make a difference in Texas or Arizona or Washington or Oregon. So what we really need to do is build a project in a place like Texas, full disclosure, I'm a little biased because I used to be managing director of Texas Central, but that's a place where you would not only be able to get a tremendous return on investment, doesn't cost very much because it's relatively inexpensive to build across the plains of Texas. You're not navigating uh, through Greenwich, Connecticut to build high-speed rail, but you're also going to show that those red-blooded red state Texans will ride high-speed trains too. And I think that would be truly transformative for our debate and for future prospects of funding. So another, sorry, go ahead. Got another two part question. What provisions are in the bill to encourage states uh, to shift formula funds historically spent on highway expansion to rail and what powers do they already have? Then what is being done to encourage states to toll existing highway miles without adding or requiring them to add new toll lanes? So I don't think there's much of anything in the Senate bill. In the House bill, in the House passed bill, which, which I should emphasize was passed with bipartisan support. Not many Republicans voted for it, um, but some did. That bill has some of these incentives in it. One of the things that the House uh, Transportation Committee Chairman Peter DeFazio talks a lot about is a testimony we had from the Virginia um, DOT uh, secretary who said that she looked at the congestion problem they have in I-95 realized that a lot of it was coming from trucks and looked at what would it cost to improve capacity on the parallel CSX freight rail line uh, versus improving capacity on the highway itself. She found that improving capacity on the freight rail line was much less expensive. Oh, by the way, better for the environment, better for safety since a lot of Americans on our highways get crushed and die from truck accidents. Um, you know, better for a lot of different ways, but among other things, it was just a simply, simply better investment, um, cost less money uh, to build. Now that story is strangely hard to believe in America because it's so remarkably unusual. That's a story you'd hear anywhere else in the world every day of the week, but here in America, 
states never look at that as an alternative. I mean, I'm from Massachusetts. We think of ourselves as pretty progressive. There's a big debate right now about exactly what kinds of, uh, what we're gonna do to improve uh, traffic to the Cape, specifically replacing some of the uh, old uh, Army Corps of Engineers bridges over the Cape Cod Canal. It's gonna cost billions of dollars. No one's even asking the question, what would it cost to build high-speed rail from Boston to the Cape instead? And it's a shame that no one's asking that question because it might be less expensive. It's definitely gonna be better for the environment. It's definitely gonna be way, way faster than driving. And it's definitely gonna be way better for traffic on the Cape. We'll probably end up building bigger bridges across the Cape Cod Canal. That's just gonna put more cars into the small villages and cute towns, cute beach towns, uh, all up and down Cape Todd, Cod further increasing traffic congestion. What would it, how transformative would it be if you could get from Boston to Cape Cod in 25 minutes and not have another car on the road? Yet we're not even looking at that. We're not even asking the question if that's a viable alternative. So bottom line is that we got to find a way to get provisions of the House pass bill into the Senate bill because the Senate bill includes almost nothing in this department. Next question, what's being done to restore rail funding in the reconciliation bill and not just shunt it all to the bipartisan infrastructure framework? Well, the problem is that the way that the um, that uh, Senator Sanders, Bernie Sanders came out with his uh, uh, budget proposal, it has very little money that goes, that's in the category of um, plussing up transportation. So we were hoping that his budget framework would come out and, and allocate you know, 100, 200 billion dollars to plussing up transportation. It's much, much less than that. Um, there's about 60 billion dollars. And through the work of you and others, we have been able to get high-speed rail on the chairman's top priority list, top five priority list. That's a huge win. I guarantee you that just a year ago, high-speed rail would not have been on his top five priority list, but it's still on a list of five priorities. 60 divided by five doesn't leave a lot of money for high-speed rail. So I'm very disappointed with where we are right now. But again, I do think it's transformative if we can just get a couple of high-speed rail projects built by cobbling together different funding sources that are in the various bills, the reconciliation process, and then of course also allowing contributions from the private sector. So this next question is a composite of two uh, questions sort of getting at a similar point. Um, in Paris, 110 miles of catenary were replaced during overnight uh, shutdowns. Um, that is re only requiring overnight shutdowns over a six year period for 300 million. In the last 30 years, Metro North Railroad replaced 220 miles of catenary over, th oh, again, over 30 years for 1 billion. Um, relatedly, construction productivity has been stagnant in the U.S. for decades, um, broadly speaking, but certainly in transit infrastructure. Will you push for legislation, possibly part of the reconciliation bill, to require transit agencies applying for funding to improve their maintenance practices so we see less, weight, less uh, waste and more cost effectiveness in getting more total uh, mileage and uh, riders served? You know, that's a great question because I'm very well aware of the facts and figures here. Uh, I mean, it's just despairing uh, how much it costs to build here compared to other countries in the world, pretty much every other country in the world. Um, I hadn't actually thought of the idea of putting a requirement like that into the reconciliation process. I'll take this suggestion, I'll take this question as a suggestion uh, back to my team and see if there is something that we can do. I'm also very anxious to read a report that just came out that was actually authored by a former intern of mine who was doing transportation work on my team a few years ago and went off and did a tremendous research, uh, a tremendous amount of research on this particular problem. Uh, I have been on a personal level very consumed with the withdrawal from Afghanistan at the moment, I have a lot of Afghan friends and families I've been trying to get out. And so I've been uh, focused on that for the last few weeks and have not read his report since it only just came out. But I look forward to reading that and trying to better understand exactly what the drivers of these massive uh, costs are when we build and repair infrastructure in America.
There's another question um, on uh, highway spending. Transportation accounts for 28% of greenhouse gas emissions. Highway transportation is responsible for 82% of transportation emissions. Air travel is responsible for 9%, rail 2%. Uh, High-speed rail, as envisioned in the Northwest, will generally shift air travel to rail. Why not concentrate on addressing the 82% instead of the 9%? <laughs> I mean, I, I wish I had a better answer for you because it makes so much sense, and that's absolutely what we should be doing. But the answer is politics. Uh, it's bad politics. And uh, I think that in my short time on the Transportation Committee, I've started to change a lot of minds. I've heard from colleagues uh, who said, uh, I want to learn more about this high-speed rail. It seems like it makes sense. Um, but it, look, we haven't um, been able to totally change the politics around this, and that's an ongoing fight. And unfortunately, what you see in the transportation bill is not a result of sound policy. It's a result of, of complicated partisan uh, politics and bickering and negotiations. And so we're just kind of doubling down on the same old stuff. And that's, uh, that, that, that is really unfortunate. One of the things I will throw back out at you um, because there's an incredibly talented group uh, here uh, this afternoon is a question that I have in my mind, which is that if we spend a lot of money subsidizing electric vehicles, what will the effects of that actually be on congestion? Because if we spend billions of dollars helping people buy electric vehicles, Necessarily, there are going to be people um, who might have taken a train, might have taken an alternative, who are now going to be attached to their um, fancy new car. Uh, maybe people who wouldn't have bought a new car uh, if not for this subsidy. And while driving around an electric vehicle is generally better for the environment, although you always have to obviously look at how the electricity is produced, if it increases congestion, and there are still a lot of gas powered vehicles on the highway as we always, as we know there will be, um, you know, it's not gonna be anytime soon that everybody uh, gives up their old pickup truck and converts to an electric, uh, you know, um, two ton or whatever. Um, if that's the case, what does it actually do for emissions? I think there's a, there's a scenario in which heavy subsidies for electric vehicles actually make congestion worse and therefore have an environmental cost. I would love it if one of uh, the smart people on the Zoom today uh, could do that research and come back to me and my team with the answer. That's something policymakers should know. I think uh, you'd get a lot of support from this crowd for um, embarking on such an idea. And if anyone wants to jump on that, uh, please, please do. Um, question about how uh, uh, rail relates to slashing emissions. How do you see optimizing our rail system as an important way to slash emissions uh, in half by 2030? Um, relatedly, will federal money for high-speed rail be available for regional projects uh, for 100 mile an hour trains traveling on existing corridors? So look, key to having a major impact on emissions is getting a lot of people to ride trains. So you can't just build a nice a train that, that, you know, maybe the folks on this call uh, like to ride, but doesn't attract huge numbers because that's just not going to have a significant impact on em emissions. And this is one of the reasons why I'm so focused on high speed rail, because if you look at all the ridership studies, you have to go fast to get people to ride your train in big numbers. So if we just build more 70 mile per hour Amtrak service or 79 mile per hour Amtrak service to be precise, it's not gonna get the kind of numbers that we need to have an impact on emissions. That's just the, that's just the reality. There are certainly places where slower trains uh, will work as feeders into a high-speed rail trunk system. But the only way to have a significant impact on emissions is to actually have trains fast enough that a lot of people uh, get out of their cars and off of airplanes um, and get on high-speed rail. Once you get to that point, one of the other advantages that no one ever really talks about is that you can have a lot of high-speed package service as well. Think about all the Amazon packages right now uh, that are transported by truck. Uh, the, the delivery times are too fast to uh, go on transcontinental trains. 
Um, it's only long haul freight that really makes it on today's freight railroads, uh, although they do do a lot of, of package shipping for, uh, for UPS in particular. Um, but all the short, uh, the short haul stuff uh, goes on trucks. Imagine how transformative it would be from an environmental perspective to put the stuff that's currently going on trucks and planes, by the way, I left out planes, you know, all these FedEx packages going around on planes. Imagine if you could put all of that or a huge percentage of it at least on high speed rail. Emissions free small package delivery would have a huge impact on emissions um, beyond getting a lot of passengers to ride your trains. So again, this is a place where we've got to make sure we're making the smart transformative generational decisions here. Um, I think that if we spend a lot of money building slow speed trains that were fast in 1920, but are not fast in 2020, and as a result, nobody rides them, then not only will it have a minimal impact on emissions, but it will show a lot of people in Washington that I guess people don't ride trains, so we shouldn't invest in more. So some people, Amtrak basically believes that if you make modest improvements now, you'll, these high-speed high rail will follow down the road. I think it could actually be the exact opposite. You spend a lot of money making only modest improvements, you don't see huge ridership gains, and then the legislators in Washington uh, say, this just isn't worth it. So for example, if you had $10 billion and you decided you could either give a billion dollars each to 10 different states to make trains a little bit faster, or you could spend all $10 billion to finish the project in Texas, any day of the week, I would say, spend all $10 billion to finish the project in Texas. And then what you'll see is a lot of these other states realize they want high-speed rail too. Yeah, the the um, potential for high speed and freight is certainly an interesting one, especially now as we're seeing more of a shift to um, fast, uh, fast um, freight, faster freight demand than um, right. is historically. And, and let me just add on this: like some people hear that and say, "Oh, this is threatening because there are incumbents who won't want to switch." Look, if you can go to FedEx and say, "Put your package on our train." And it will cost them less money to ship it. They're gonna buy. They're gonna do that, you know. So this doesn't have to be a threat to, um, you know, existing industry or or say, oh well, FedEx controls this. They're not gonna want to do this because they already have their planes. If you can show them that it's 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 cheaper, and, and yes, it's cheaper because it's way more efficient to put a package on a high speed train um, than to send it up thirty thousand feet in the air only to come back down. Um, you know, you, you there's a real there's a real market there. So if we have time for just one more question, uh, there's one that actually came in the chat. Excellent, thanks so much. Um, what would your response be to folks who are afraid of being displaced from their homes or businesses because of construction of a high-speed rail program? You're lucky you're not in the way of a highway because highways take up about 10 times as much land area as high-speed rail. The fact that we're still building highways all across America, expanding highways and, and literally building new ones even today, shows that there are a lot of people who are still going to be displaced by transportation projects. We can displace a lot fewer by being by building high-speed rail. And it's not just in the homes that are displaced by actual line construction. Because people on high-speed trains can often connect to regional rail can get to a city without having to drive, you need a lot less parking in cities as well. So one of the secondary benefits of high-speed rail is the effects on land use. And it's not only less land along the actual corridor where the track is laid, but also in the destination cities where you have fewer cars on the, on the road as a result of high-speed rail service. And so much less land area is devoted to parking lots. Uh, which are terrible for the environment. They take away trees, they take away vegetation, they take away places for people to live, and they spread everything out with huge seas of asphalt uh, that actually contribute directly to global warming themselves. So um, huge benefits in terms of land use with high-speed rail. Sure. Well, thank you so much, Congressman Moulton, for your time and for your advocacy for improving um, passenger rail uh, and getting it to the the point that we'd all like to see it uh, reach. Um, hey, thank you, uh, everyone on this call. Thank you for your advocacy, your tireless on the ground work. We've made a lot of progress. We're a lot farther along than many people thought we would be.
just a year ago, but obviously we still have a long way to go. And your work, your partnership uh, in my work is gonna be really critical uh, in the days, uh, months and years ahead. So I look forward to staying in touch. Take care, everybody. Take care. Thanks a lot, Ethan. Thank you, Norman. Sure, thanks, oh. thanks for this. Um, let me let people unmute. Uh, Ethan, you're, uh, can people mute, unmute themselves right now? Yes. Yes. Awesome. We should probably close yeah. the, the yes. recording. Yeah. We close out, the, want, want to close the recording out on.